started. We will call the uh, meeting to order and Chapman Grubbs. Shall we pray? Oh Lord, hear our prayer. We take this moment to hold in care awareness of your sacred presence within. We know the breath of your spirit flows within our flesh and blood, making us each living souls. Let us be in all of this, your dwelling within ourselves, to be part of the care and creation of all life. We say that sometimes the daily news reveals our brokenness and pain calling forth from our communities fear and anger, division and conflict, and sometimes despair about what may seem so evil. Yet we know held in every brokenness, you abide, revealing the possibility of peace and hope and love, flowing from the breath and heartbeat of each one of us. We know this is true because we see and embrace it every day the rooms and hallways of our hospital. We're sometimes astounded that you have placed such work and responsibility in our hands and given us gifts and ability to be part of healing and hope. We are grateful. We want to be mindful and careful stewards of our work. We want to learn and grow as part of your will of love and care for all. Help this to be so. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. You have your agenda that was sent out in your package. Um, I will request, I am going to ask one change on the consent calendar. Dr. Baxter and Mr. Goodrich, um, they did such a good job uh, presenting the other night, and I put that uh, resolution on the consent calendar, and I just decided it was too good to leave on the consent, so I wanted uh, the trustees that were not at budget and finance to hear that, so I inconvenienced them by asking them to come back, and I am pulling that off the consent calendar and putting it on the regular calendar, and that would be resolution uh, 5602. And with that one change, uh, does anyone uh, have any other changes to the agenda? Okay. Uh, special guest uh, this evening. Uh, I do have one friend here in the front row. My very first client ever when I moved to Chattanooga, Larry Primavera, was uh, he asked me if we were having a meeting tonight, and I said, sure. He said, I'm going to come and watch. So, Larry, <laughs> welcome. Um, <clears throat> and we'll start off with our committee and uh, subcommittee reports. Uh, uh, Mr. Studer, Budget and Finance. We did meet, and uh, we now have two resolutions on the regular calendar. Very good. Uh, Dr. Miller? Uh, no, uh, we met no report for the open meeting. Okay. Tom Ed, I don't think y'all met this month, did you? We did not meet. We did not meet this month. Audit compliance? Uh, we did not meet. Not meet. Uh, and I don't think uh, Ms. Stanley, she called in for the MBAC meeting today, but I don't think she is on the phone for this one. So. Uh, to my knowledge, legal committee meeting is going to be on Monday, is that correct? Yes. yes. Uh, Management Board Evaluation Committee did meet just prior to this meeting at 4 o'clock this afternoon, and we have nothing to bring before the uh, board tonight, and Personnel Committee did not meet. So with that, we will move right into, uh, if I could, uh, let's start with Dr. Bas Baxter and Mr. Goodrich. Um, what? Oh, special presentation. Thank you, Kitty. That's what you're talking about. I almost, uh, I almost went right past. So, uh, Dr. Blake. Hey, OC. Dr. Blake's not here. I can go with him. Yes. Good evening. There is a special presentation, and I would like to ask we have a special guest, Ms. Claire Fosol. If she would come up to the front, please. And also, Dr. Strait is in the back. Could I ask you to come up? I'm not going to take a lot of time to introduce uh, Mrs. Vosol, and I hope I'm pronouncing that close. That's the southern rendition of a French name. So, anyway, uh, 
I actually was at home over the weekend reading the paper and I saw her um, letter that she presented to the Chattanooga Times. So I would just like for her to give a testimonial and this definitely is something that speaks to quality. So Ms. Basola, what do you think? Well, I'm, I'm basically here to tell my story, uh, which happened about a couple months ago. Uh, I was diagnosed with a very large brain tumor. Uh, Dr. Strait is the one who broke the news to me. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was, uh, luckily it was benign, I was very lucky. And the story went so well and so smoothly that I felt um, like writing this letter to the editor in Shadow Without Times Free Press. And now I'm here to to tell my story in person uh, with a little more detail. Uh, so it was April 15, and uh, there, there had been warning signs, which uh, I was good at ignoring, I guess, or setting aside. Um, but um, eventually, on, uh, on April 15, I, I woke up in the middle of the night with very violent vomiting, headaches um, that was worsening, uh, not able to hold any medication for headache down, uh, vomiting, vomiting. And, uh, and eventually, uh, Basically, to kind of back up in the story, I had had warning signs and uh, I had made a, an appointment with a neurologist uh, because my gynecologist I re had recommended that. And uh, so I did. And then I got the news that my family from France was going to visit. So I thought, well, I don't want to worry my mother, <coughs> so I'm going to wait a little. And I'll make an appointment just after she's, she's gone. So I did that, and uh, well, basically, the emergency day was the last day of her visit. So um, that was kind of a, not such a nice way to break the news to her, but that's what happened, that's how it happened. And uh, basically, uh, I guess the, the tumor had grown too large. And, uh, and eventually, uh, in the morning, uh, a day I had taken off to spend with my family, um, I canceled the plans for the day, and uh, I noticed my speech was kind of slowing down. So I called my husband at noon and I told him, you have to take me to the ER. So he got out of work, uh, picked me up, and uh, we, uh, we went to the ER. We started with Memorial, it was the closest. And then after they found the tumor, they transferred me to Erlanger right away. They said, that's the place where you need to be. And, uh, and uh, I felt almost a bit of relief, I have to say, because all of a sudden I'm like, so that's what was happening this whole time. Um, but uh, of course it was intimidating news, but I have to say that the second I got to Erlanger, or the second I was conscious enough to witness it, um, I felt calm and I felt confidence around me. I felt uh, a lot of skills, a lot of energy put around me. And, uh, and I, I was uh, inclined to trust everybody who was suggesting anything to me. And uh, Dr. Strait was the first one, and he, and he uh, came up with a plan. Uh, he said that luckily I was, I was close to uh, get in a, into a coma when uh, I got to Erlanger, but uh, luckily there was, uh, they got to me on time, basically. And uh, he suggested a, a plan with a treatment uh, that first uh, was going to get an arthroscopy and, uh, and a full body scan. The full body scan uh, kind of confirmed what he had thought that uh, the tumor was most likely benign. So that was great news. And, uh, and then uh, we went on to an arthroscopy that day to cauterize all the arteries that were feeding the tumor. And, uh, and then, you know, the day after, I already was feeling great really because because the, the pressure in my head had diminished of course and uh, and then he said we'll we'll do uh, we'll do um, surgery on the 20th which was five days after after the initial emergency and uh, again so I from neuro ICU at Erlanger I was moved to a regular room and I was given a treatment for three days and uh, and I met great people nurses, uh, technicians, everybody was really nice. Um, sometimes I think, you know, all these people I met, surely somebody was having a bad day that day. But you know <laughs> what? Nobody, if that was the case, nobody showed it. Nobody showed it. Uh, just a, a bunch of really nice people. 
and uh, I was uh, made to feel really comfortable. Um, day of the surgery was uh, April 20th, it was a Monday, and, uh, and uh, I, again, uh, the uh, anesthesiology team was, uh, was wonderful. They made me feel so comfortable from the second I was in that, in that, uh, in that room, and uh, we just had conversations, not necessarily about my condition, but all sorts of things, and, and uh, I felt, again, a lot of kindness, a lot of uh, competence. And, um, and then surgery took place, it was seven hours. Uh, Dr. Street had told me it was uh, uh, quite a task to remove that tumor, but that he was gonna get it done, and he did. And, uh, and I remember waking up at neuro ICU, and I had a, a bit of family and friends around, and, and then he came by, and, um, and just uh, made, again, made me feel really, uh, really confident that that I was just gonna be fine. And uh, then uh, after that one day at neuro ICU, mm -hmm. I went, I was transferred to a, to a regular room and two days after surgery, I was discharged. And I remember saying, uh, looking at Dr. Stone, are you sure I'm ready? <laughs> uh, two days seemed like a short time, but he, he said, he looked at me, he said, you're ready. So I'm like, if he says I'm ready, I'm ready. <laughs> and uh, and I, guess, uh, I guess I was, because I went home and, and recovery went well. And I was amazed that, you know, um, uh, this might make you laugh, but two days after surgery, the day after I got home, I was feeding my chickens. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, I thought, how can this be? But um, I guess, you know, uh, it's all in the idea we have of brain surgery being extremely intimidating. Um, um, and it is, it's serious, but I'm just amazed how, how some expert staff can handle it. And, um, and uh, I know Erlanger was the place to be. Uh, so I, wanna, I wanted to be here to say thank you to, uh, to everybody. Uh, the, the letter to the editor was a start, and, and then uh, it led to this, and I'm glad to have an opportunity to do this. I'd be glad to answer any question if you have any, but um, that's basically the story. Thank you. And uh, I just wanted to add that trust and confidence on top of an expert staff, um, I think that's the best combination. And, and, and it takes the staff to inspire confidence. And, uh, and I was really lucky, extremely lucky. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I, I'm <coughs> thrilled that she's doing so well. Mm -hmm. But what I want to say is this is a great place for me to do what I do. It, and it's, we had a great team. Uh, the emergency room took care of her, the floor, the ICU, great operating room. Uh, Blaze, you uh, uh, embolized her feeding vessels and made the surgery a lot easier, so that made it uh, a lot easier for me, and the operating room team and everything. So this is a great place to be able to do uh, neurosurgery, and I couldn't have done it any better without the support that I received. And this is uh, a testimony to what we can do here. Good job. Thank you. Yes. The next short presentation. Please go right ahead. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. This makes it worth it, doesn't it? What better quality could we show you than this? So thank you for participating. Okay, this is just a very short update. If you remember back in May, I gave you the details of what we were. Uh, trying to implement and execute with the RN compensation model. So this is the update of phase two that I promised you. So Erlinger uh, nursing leadership, which does include the unit managers, the directors, clinical administrators, and the CNOs of all the five campuses, we've all worked diligently to determine competency level for every single bedside nurse. 
and then we worked in collaboration with Human Resources to prepare the model for the second phase of implementation. A lot of those directors, managers, and clinical administrators are in the back and the CNOs. We've partnered with Sullivan Cotter to assist with the last three steps, which are validation of the RN market rates, alignment of the RN model rates to the market rate, and then for costing analysis for the implementation. So Sullivan and Cotter employed the following methodology they match the appropriate RM benchmarks out in the market to the Erlanger levels based on years of experience and out of this we found that our compensation model is comparable in the market ranges and exceeds in the acceleration of a nurse if the nurse meets performance metrics uh, related to pay for performance. You'll see here the key components of the adjusted RN model, comp compensation model, and it's market driven as far as salaries. But the goal uh, was to place greater emphasis on horizontal movement across the levels of nursing correlating to the pay for performance. While tenure is still very important and recognized, there are greater incentives to move horizontally versus vertically just with tenure. Now, RNs can decide not to move uh, to progress to each level but the salary of course opportunities are increased as they move across now I want to give you a little detail this is probably the more detailed slide that you want to see because of the limitations last year if you recall it was a uh, just a little uh, contentious about moving to level three and level four because it was required to have a BSN to do this but after monthly meetings, held a total of nine monthly meetings with the tenured nurse committee and listening to their concerns, the decision was made to remove the BSN requirement uh, to be able to move to level three or four. Now, the requirements remain stringent, so it doesn't mean we've made it just easy for everybody to get to level three. We've <coughs> simply moved that one requirement uh, of the BSN or the MSN. Uh, in lieu of that, we have put in national certifications and achieving other quality metrics that are hardwired and in line with the hospital performance metrics. So those nurses can move through the model on a horizontal level and be recognized with a pay increase. Now, some of those tenured nurses are above market salary to begin with but they did move to a level three or four. So rather than just say, oh, thank you, we're glad you did this, now you're recognized as a level three. And as they said, it's not about the money, it's about the recognition. But we all know recognition sometimes does need to be rewarded and with monetary funds. So even though those nurses are at or above market level, uh, rather than just not do anything this year, they will receive a lump sum payment that is equal to 2% even though they are at or above market. The nurses of those tenured nurses, and we're talking about 26 or so nurses, those nurses that remained at level two because of performance are the only nurses that will not receive a pay increase. Additionally, the nurses that have tenure that were at market or above and did not receive the BSN differential because they've been here for so many years they will receive that 50 cent differential as the other nurses did last year. So I hope that this will, uh, or I'm not hoping because I know this addresses all of the different issues. I think we've come back with a model that we've proven that nothing is ever perfect the first time you implement it. The important thing is listening to the staff and communication and going forward uh, from that perspective. So I think you're going to hear a lot of satisfaction in that this was validated not just Erlanger or our nursing uh, leadership and our Erlanger human resources, but it's been validated by Solomon and Carter, which we've used many times for benefits and compensation. So we know we're on the right track. We know we've addressed the issues. The first year we addressed compression issues, and this year now we've been able to do some market increases and get us uh, the comparable market. Their database uh, for market salaries is related or is um, based on national, state, and regional local data. 
So I think we can all have the same communication and feel good now about what we did about our nurses' raises. I want to thank you all as a board and Mr. Spiegel for uh, the opportunity to be able to administer such a cutting edge um, compensation model. Uh, one thing in our discussions with um, Sullivan and Cotter, they did say, well, we had to go out and really look, you know, no one is, is doing this as Erlanger, you're one of the first we've seen uh, step out for pay for performance for nurses. And uh, so he's asked for our model if he could actually utilize and get back with us and uh, look at our model as a best practice. So I think we've uh, uh, did a good thing there and I think our nurses are gonna be very well pleased. Do you have any questions? Yes. And I think, I think we asked this before, but just to give us, remind us about um, the levels and what the different levels mean. Level one is a novice or beginner nurse. And in that level, there's two actually little sections of that, the novice new graduate, and then there's an advanced beginner. And in that level, it would, might be a nurse that um, has been a nurse tech, something like that. So we do give credit for that. So that's level one. The second level <coughs> is a competent nurse, meaning that they've proven competency, they've proven that they can do the skills and they've went through all the checkoffs that we say that we require to use. Now those are unit specific, so uh, it could be that if they're in an ICU or a NICU, that's gonna be a little different than uh, general med surge force. So it's geared and poised to, or positioned to address that. The uh, third level is a proficient nurse, meaning that a nurse that has now gained competency, a nurse that looks uh, not only just at that patient, but looks at a more global uh, position with the patients they're looking more at quality and how we bring uh, the totality I guess of the patient uh, level four is the expert nurse and in that we look at a, a global a nurse that has global knowledge that works very independently as far as critical thinking is proactive with discharge and proactive with the things for a disease population not just looking at his or uh, her one patient but looking at the population of patients and what they can do to make a difference um, in the criteria that's specific for each level for each unit they have national certifications that they require they also have criteria for meeting that patient's need if it's a diabetic floor what are they doing uh, to teach uh, so all those things go into the levels three and four but there's not a criteria limiting any nurse from getting there. Now, we have, uh, like I say, some nurses that are happy with being a level two, being competent, and that's, that's good and that's fine, but I think with a lot of peer pressure, uh, if you've been here for any length of time, you're going to want to perform and do as you should do for our patients. So I think if you look, you'll see that we had a jump from the twos to threes, and that's related partly because of the BSM, removing that. But also, I think it's the desire and the goals of the nurses and those unit specific things that they need to do. I think that has driven them to want to uh, serve our patients in that manner. So I think we're well on our way to a, a good model. I wanted to present this again so we'll be all be clear on the communication and believe me we have two uh, mandatory sessions we've already had one today the directors and clinical administrators and will all be meeting one-on-one -on -one to do the education and lay the plan out there of course they're aware of um, the levels and what that means but <coughs> they need to know specifically if they were rated at this level why and what they need to do if they need to move to another level so it's very, very clear as how they get, it's up to them now as to where they want to go with it. If I, I should be able just, to, okay. I make just a couple of uh, general remarks. One is, I mean, this truly is a progressive model as far as our compensation. If you think about where the organization or the healthcare system in this region that provides the most advanced medicine academic medical center. So, so we're looking for highly competent nurses. Now we have a compensation model, model that one, will allow the current nurses to grow their competencies and be re uh, rewarded for that from a compensation perspective and also from a recruitment, uh, you know, on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, we'll be able to better recruit those highly competent nurses. 
And secondly, I know Britt has said on a number of occasions, and, and as far as budgeting is concerned, we budgeted $2.7 million, 5.4 over the course of two years. You see $2.3 million, just slightly over $2.3 million. The additional 400000 is to fund the lump sums for the nurses that Jan spoke of, and also for the salary sensitive benefits. So the full 2.7 million is being allocated for the RN raises. Dr. Keith, I should be able to follow this. Is the 15-16 your projection and the current is where we are today? Current is where we are today, right, and, the projection. And the 15-16 is where you're planning to be? Yes, okay. where we will be with this implementation. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Keith. Thank you. And I see how I messed up on the uh, coming down the agenda now. I saw review agenda, then I saw review minutes, and I skipped down and missed that section, so I apologize. And now we'll review the minutes of the uh, May 28th meeting uh, that you had in your package. And uh, if uh, there are no changes or adjustments, I will entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Motion is second. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Now, Mr. Hutchinson? Uh, yes. Is one other. There is one other, OI. Yes, we do have another guest, and I apologize. I had this and got her here on time and didn't fail to introduce her. We have Dr. Chris Smith. She was trying to get out that door there. <laughs> uh, she is the dean of the nursing school, UTC uh, Nursing School. and. I want to tell you in development of the model, we didn't go into philosophy today, but she was very instrumental in uh, to validate that we were doing a best practice with our philosophy of how we went. So it took philosophy and then the implementation with the operation issues. But I wanted to introduce Dr. Chris Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Baxter and I are here uh, uh, for approval of a resolution seeking approval to replace Lab 2 in the Special Procedures Department. Our current situation is that the lab um, we're seeking to replace is 16 years old. It's exceeded its useful life. Uh, the, the, the lab is having si significant downtime issues and uh, it, it um, has significantly higher radiation exposure than, than what modern equipment would, would have. Um, so the new lab will enhance services that I'm going to allow Dr. Baxter to talk about here in a minute uh, with a project cost of about 3.2 million. I think exactly on the resolution it's 3.199825. Uh, and then uh, we have a, a with a net present value of $163,570 over five years. So with that, I'm going to let Dr. Baxter talk to you a little bit about the, how it will enhance our services. Well, I, I wanted to start with our patient guest has left, but I, I wanted to thank her in her absence because I know when we do the business of medicine, it's sometimes hard to get a glimpse of the impact that we have on people's lives. And so I want to thank you for your involvement to, to have stories like that uh, happen. And it's, it's great. I get to share in that daily to see, you know, sort of people uh, hear their story. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing that people come forward and, and tell their story. Uh, good stories in, in the world of interventional radiology and interventional neuroradiology. Um, as, as Mr. Goodrich has said, our volume has really, uh, you know, gone through the roof. If you take a baseline, we were a busy um, practice uh, here in 2010, doing about 11,500 procedures uh, based in two angio rooms that sit sort of side by side um, and CT work. Um, if you look from 2010 to 2015, we've had several years, 2014 to 15, 22% growth. This year we're on track to be about 20% growth. So we may double that. If we go on this projection, we'll be at probably 22,000 procedures. Some months we're at about 2,500 procedures a month right now. So, so, so the growth has just been explosive. Uh, that 
area of the hospital is where we deliver. Uh, you hear a lot about the stroke work we're doing, but really it's a comprehensive program. It's, it's anything that almost involves a needle uh, from interventional radiology, from the biopsy work that we do, uh, for oncology patients, really almost every service line is touched by that area. You know, you have pediatrics, a a any, any kind of procedural work that, uh, that is done from vascular access. So, so, so it really, uh, we get to be involved in really, uh, you know, almost all patient care that comes through there. So, so it is great uh, to have this second room. Our, our, our old uh, Bessie, so to speak, is, is kind of being, a, it was a great workhorse, but it's, it was time to, to, uh, to update that. So uh, that's what we're the business of tonight. But I think from a visionary point of view, uh, you know, with that explosive growth, we, we are at the same amount of equipment that we were serving and providing 11,500 procedures five years ago. We're almost double that now. So, if you, you know, the, the vision would be, you know, we could use uh, probably four angio rooms to do the work that we're doing right now and actually be go live and fairly uh, busy with, the, with those rooms right away. As well, there's the opportunity, c certainly, like I said, stroke gets a lot of the, the press, but uh, I, I share in the board and Mr. Spiegel's vision of, uh, you know, like lines like uh, oncology and, and stuff like that, we can definitely, uh, you know, bring technologies to those areas where we can uh, be leaders in the community and region where we offer um, procedural type of work done on, on state-of-the-art, you know, technology that our, our competitors don't offer or have. So, so uh, like I said, I, I thank you for that opportunity. It's really uh, a great uh, privilege to work in that area and invite um, all of you. I know several of you have come through that area, but if you, if you would like to see what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you're more than welcome to, to come and, and uh, spend a little time. So thank you. Entertain any questions if you have any questions. Questions? Sure. sure. My question, Tanner, and I mentioned it at the Finance Committee meeting. What, with the exponential growth, is this adequate what you're requesting? I know it's not a question, probably you don't get very often, but it sounds like it's not. Yeah. So I think D Dr. Baxter started to touch on that um, with his discussions about, you know, at, at some point, even adding a third and a fourth lab. Um, uh, to, to handle all the volume that, that we've seen. And uh, it is part of our strategic plan. Um, ultimately, today, we're landlocked a, a little bit with, with where we're at. Um, ultimately, as part of our strategic plan, uh, we, we do anticipate moving um, the interventional radiology space to, um, to a p potentially the Masood building with the, the, the neuroscience build out of, if, that takes fruition at that point we would look at adding additional labs um, just unfortunately with the space that we have today uh, there's really not a good way to, to do that programming yeah. so, so there is uh, opportunity as, as Tanner is saying to kind of you, you know um, uh, we're waiting a little bit till to build out to get space so, so neuroscience can kind of branch off and and, and set up in the Masu building you know, kind of make the investment there to kind of uh, put some more labs, be in close proximity to the ER. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think right now we could, you know, obviously use more equipment, but we're kind of waiting a little bit for the next steps, phase two. Okay, thank you. And this will be out of next year's budget, Ron? Right? That is correct. Okay, very good. One other point in the, I think I'll touch on this in budget finance, but for the broader board. During the construction of this, does this, I mean, we have, I think, Anecdotally, you said one and a half, capacity of one and a half of these things. We're going to go down to one. How long does construction take? Will it create a backlog? What, what, just a little bit on that. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the lab, <laughs> if this resolution is approved tonight, will be l delivered on July 22nd. Um, it doesn't take too long for the current lab for that to come down. That can be done in a few days. So it will be delivered on July 22nd, installed within a day or two, and then applications training will begin. And um, we anticipate a go live in the second lab of uh, around August 1st, or in that first week of August. Okay. And so obviously from a contingency plan, you know, we've, we've made sure that uh, we can continue to provide the care and, 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 you know, the things that we need to do. So, so in, you know, institutionally there are other labs that we can work in, you know, is it, is it convenient and ideal for us on a day-to-day, -day. Um, you know, a little bit of an inconvenience with, with going down to one lab, but certainly all the care can be delivered. It's just a matter of going and, and using either the endovascular labs in the OR or up to the new cardiac cath labs, so, so no patient will be in jeopardy of not getting a, a treatment. 
Other questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming back again. Tabor, the budget. Huh. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to uh, present the fiscal and sixteen budget uh, for next year. Uh, the budget has was reviewed by the Budget and Finance Committee and also uh, reviewed by the Financial Review Committee as well. The Financial Review Committee did give a positive opinion back to our chair, and I think everyone got copies of that. Uh, we also held a educational uh, luncheon for our Board of Trustees to have any follow-up questions uh, and went over some of the details as well. Uh, what you have in the resolution is on attachment one, which is the Erlanger Health System Income Statement. Uh, we, in the resolution, we're approving a charge increase in the aggregate amount of 5%. Uh, on attachment 2 is our wage and benefits structure for next year, which includes the amounts that Jan mentioned earlier. Uh, on attachment 4 is our basic requirements. Uh, and then we have our capital budgets attached, as well as our audit service budget and the compliance. Those last two items are required under the authority resolution to have those included in this resolution also. Uh, as you recall, the, uh, we're pr uh, presenting about a 3.9 operating margin. We believe this is feasible. And just as, as of today, if you remember one of those items that's in the significant issues uh, list that could impact the event got settled uh, with the, the Supreme Court decision. So that's sort of one of those items checked off at this point. But there's other items on that list that makes this a very uh, aggressive budget, and we will definitely keep both the board and the budget finance and the financial review committee updated as those things uh, become more clear as those regs and rules get uh, finalized. So I'm asking uh, your approval tonight. And I hope you don't get your feelings hurt if there's not a lot of questions, because we have talked about this for last eight weeks, I guess, yeah, so in, we've among pretty, the trustees. Pretty much looked through all of this. Right. So you, uh, our trustees have had plenty of uh, opportunity to, uh, I don't want to stifle any conversation, but that's why you might not get a lot of questions that's, tonight. That's so. fine. Now, I think we've done a really good job, and I, I do like the process that we have uh, evolved into to allow plenty of time to review, plenty of time to ask questions. Uh, so I, I very much appreciate the board's time that they've given me in the last eight weeks because I know that uh, it's, a, it's a, a volunteer job and thank you so much uh, for that and I, I also uh, said the same thing to our financial review committee because they spent a, a significant amount of time as well. That's one thing I learned as chairman quick, uh, early on is don't surprise a trustee. Yes. So uh, I learned that and uh, we try to get it out to everybody in plenty of time so you have uh, time to ask we questions. <laughs> Very good. So. Uh, any questions, Mr. Tate? I don't have any, any questions about the budget, but I just want to comment that it just seems like that there's, uh, Grant would probably, probably back me up on it, but it seems like an awful lot of assumptions that have been made in coming up with this budget. And a lot of those assumptions are not necessarily built on concrete either. They're built on moving balls that we really don't have any control over whatsoever. It just makes it very, very tough if uh, this thing falls apart in the middle of the year. It's going to be very difficult to uh, bring it back in line. But yeah, Monday night we went over, I think that was one of the questions, what are your risk factors? Uh, what, do, what can surprise us? And there was, uh, if I remember, there? we can check one off the uh, list to, today yeah, with the right. Supreme Court ruling, but there's still, if I'm not mistaken, about five or six yeah. other things that could come along. Significant material and, impact yeah. of the and, hospital. And, and I think healthcare financing is different than a lot of other industries where um, you could actually come here, get services, and not be required to pay. And the fluctuation about payer mix could change from month to month. Um, it, it, it's an industry that's challenging, and that's what makes our job so much fun mm -hmm. um, and keeps us up at night. But um, I think the amount of work 
that went into it, Brent, you and your staff should be commended. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And also, if I remember correctly, about all, all five or six of those challenges are uh, uh, unknowns. None of them were going to have an upside potential on them. Yeah. If, I, if my memory serves me correct, there's um, it's it's all downside risk. So no, it's definitely weighted to one side. That's right. So. If not, I will uh, entertain a motion uh, for approval. So moved. And a second. 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 Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Let's give Mr. Tabor, Pam, and all his staff a, a round of applause. Good evening. Tonight I'm presenting the resolution for the upgrade of the firewall. Um, it's the software, the professional services that's wrapped around it. Um, it does not exceed 676000 um, And it was presented to the budget and finance on Monday night. So I'm here to seek approval to move forward <coughs> with the purchase of Palo Alto for our firewall upgrade and hardware. We have a, a commitment from Erlanger and um, to advance our technologies. This is one of my key elements in our strategic roadmap to advance us for future state over the next couple of years. So, and I'll, if you're ready, I'll, I'll ask, I think, an important question. Okay. Everyone probably, if they're techie, they might think this way. Yeah, I can talk I'm just, chassis I'm just and talking. ports, but yeah. But um, <laughs> I do want to make sure that everyone's aware, and I'll ask you, what, what we're doing here tonight, this is totally compatible, works with and works in harmony with the, the big epic package that we're doing with this we're not gonna have to take this away this works with it right this is a long-term solution for a while for us when I draw the roadmap out I have definite key elements since that we are going to partner with an epic solution moving forward for years to come I have to start drawing the roadmap to position us this is our solution for our firewall works works fine for future state as we move forward we already have relations with um, Palo Alto which is one of the big firewall vendors that a lot of people um, go to for these kind of services. This is inclusion of the hardware, the software, and the professional services to help us implement it. So it is it is part of the element of getting us positioned for future state. And Tish, is this the same vendor we're currently using just it to is. upgrade? We, we, yes, we have relations with them now, so we're just going to upgrade. Very good. Other questions? Maybe. Um, and I guess we need to talk a little bit about HIPAA and everybody knows that every company now needs firewall to protect information, but HIPAA is a whole new level. It's easier from a user standpoint, it's easier to get into my bank than it is to Erlanger to find information on my patients. It drives me crazy, but there's a reason for that. And it's a $50,000 fine per incident um, for information that is um, uh, out there on patients. So it's a very, very, we have to have a much tighter firewall. So just so anybody, every time you get irritated because you can't get in to the system, there's a there's a plan. There's a reason. There's a reason. It, it doesn't always make it better. I'll just go spend some money and transfer funds at my bank if I get frustrated with Erlanger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're responsible for t protecting that information, and we take that very seriously here. So we want to keep advancing as we grow to make sure that we do that. Very good. Yeah, just so everybody knows, is you buy this and you have no issues. When Judy Faulkner came, the founder and CEO of Epic, um, what did she fear most in the IT industry? And that was cyber attacks. And she's concerned about that. This takes our level of security and takes it to the top level, but I don't want to get anybody um, a false level of security that that's it. I mean, they're developing things to go around these firewalls and, you know, we still have the obligation to protect things as much as we can, but um, they're always developing new techniques to go around them and try to penetrate our information and that's the world we're in today. But we still have the obligation of protecting as much as we can about our information. Very good. Any other questions? 
I'll entertain a motion for approval. Second. And second. Second. And motion is second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed like sign. That leaves one item on our consent. Oh, thank you, Ms. Ingalls. Thank you. Uh, that leaves one item on our consent calendar, uh, resolution 5601. And if I could entertain a motion for approval of consent calendar. So moved. Motion. Second. Second. All, right. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, <coughs> moving on down our agenda, I don't think I've left off anything else. Um, uh, Dr. Kern, uh, Chief of Staff report. I have no report. Okay. Dr. Seaberg. Well, today was the official day of orientation for the new residents and fellows. There are, there are 63 new residents and fellows that started today. And despite what you hear, July is not a bad time to get sick because there will be more doctors than ever in July. August I'm not so sure about, but July, it's okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Spiegel. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. I do want to acknowledge Dr. Seberg and the College of Medicine. Early this morning, I did present to the incoming uh, House staff. Um, it, it is one of those sure pleasures that you get to introduce the healthcare organization to new, bright, first time physicians. Um, I think they bring a lot of diversity and a lot of knowledge to Erlanger, and it makes Erlanger a special place. And the relationship between Erlanger and the college has never been better. And today was surely an example of that relationship. And so for that, I, I thank you. Um, King versus Burwell, the United States Supreme Court made a lot of decisions today, and all of those decisions were published. Um, but they weighed in on whether or not the federal government could subsidize exchange programs in states. Um, and the Supreme Court upheld uh, the decision that it was, in fact, legal to subsidize uh, state health plans. It did put about 350,000 insured Tennesseans at risk of which about 160,000 of them do receive subsidy from the federal government. And I think that's good for our state. I think it's good for health care. And um, I was proud that we took this step forward. Um, I know there's going to be a lot of press around the issue, but I think it was a good decision for Hamilton County patients, residents, and Tennesseans at large. Um, we held a service awards ceremony for um, our employees. Um, I believe, I think Mr. Studer was there representing the Board of Trustees. Uh, we honored a lot of employees, and Linda Benford um, received 45 year uh, certificate for serving this hospital and, and the patients. Um, we honored 10 associates that had 40 years of service, 26 associates with 30 years of service, um, and it, it was an exceptional um, human resources and the services committee did an unbelievable job putting that together. I do want to acknowledge Dr. Phil Jackson and the Erlanger East Hospital. They had a groundbreaking uh, ceremony on Monday. It was extremely well attended. Our um, Mayor Coppinger was there, um, as well as Phil Fulmer, one of the past head coaches of the University of Tennessee football coach. Um, his daughter recently had a baby at Erlanger East and felt obligated to also share his positive story with everybody in attendance. And it was, it was absolutely um, a wonderful experience and really lifted and made a real commitment of Erlanger's um, investment 
to expand patient care in this community. Um, Modern Healthcare released their rankings um, for the top public hospitals and the largest public hospitals in the United States, and Erlanger went from the 10th position to the seventh largest public hospital system in the United States, and that's something everybody in this room should be proud of. I just wanted to update the board on some of the progresses, and we, we do know that our census is growing and that we're responding um, aggressively to that, but we have opened up 12 uh, med surge beds at Erlanger East. That is really a substantial move because we had closed Erlanger, I'm, I'm sorry, North. north. Um, we had closed Erlanger North, um, what, seven, eight years ago, and now we're opening it up to beds. The infrastructure is there, the beds were there, um, everything was there except the ability to staff it. Dr. Keyes and her team has worked really hard with Rob Brooks um, and Dr. Phil Jackson to get that up to speed and we opened that up. The orthopedic surgical suite uh, is scheduled to open January of 16. The cath labs and four OR Street suites at Erlanger East are scheduled to come online in March of 16. And the main campus cafeteria and the new physician lounge is, will hopefully open uh, 2015, hopefully with Sodexo now managing that. We have to make sure that goes um, on schedule. I do want to also bring you up to date. You know, we have a bariatric pro program, and it got surveyed for the first time, and it received full accreditation as a bariatric center of excellence. I do want to acknowledge Dr. Keyes and her staff, as well as Dr. Sanborn, for all their efforts to get this Center of Excellence accreditation. And, it, and again, I just want to acknowledge Britt Tabor for all he does to get that budget um, to rest. And now all the challenges are just before <laughs> us, it, at least begin on July 1. Um, I'm glad with Dr. Keyes that we're able to implement the second phase um, for the bedside nurses and a 3% raise for all employees um, in January. And um, that's my report, Mr. Chairman, and I will stay here and if there are any questions. I will uh, commend the entire management team uh, out at East. It was a, a great uh, uh, groundbreaking, and several of the trustees were here. I appreciate yeah. you attending. So uh, even though it was 97 degrees, I think, <laughs> uh, you guys pulled it off rather well. And then my other, only other comment is I can't wait till Dr. Keyes has to open up the remaining beds at North. Yes. Uh, I ask about that about every week or two. So. Uh, I'll be glad when that uh, we have needs for that. So thank you very much. Does anybody uh, have any other questions, Mr. Speaker? Anything else to bring before the board? You have upcoming meetings. Uh, uh, you see at the bottom of your agenda. So uh, make sure you uh, make your meetings. Uh, uh, and I see that we do have budget and finance committee meetings. Sometimes we skip July, but are we? We, put, skip it. we might have because we don't have the don't final have uh, results of from we don't our have audit. scheduled resolutions either. So. No schedule. So, so if, even though that's on here, you might get an email saying, "Let's don't meet." No. Mm -hmm. So, we'll we'll see. Anybody have anything else? I will remind my trustees we have credentialing meeting uh, following this. Uh, we'll just meet up at the board office, and that way we won't have to uh, hustle. Uh, things around down here so we'll just meet the board office so with that this meeting is adjourned